This video is about two of the historic lift bridges of Portland, Oregon, the Hawthorne Bridge and the Steel Bridge. This aerial view of Portland from 1939 shows its unique collection of historic movable bridges, including swing, lift, and bascule design. In another video, we cover the general history of these bridges. Regarding lift bridges, there are five still working examples in the Portland area. In this video, we will concentrate on the Hawthorne and Steel bridges. Hawthorne because it was first and provides an example of the standard lift design. Then we will show how engineers arrived at the unique design of the Steel bridge. And finally, note that both of these bridges are still around at 100 years of age. Let us start with a little bit of history. Here is a view of Portland that I think is fun to look at. It is a panorama labeled from 1890 featuring the Willamette River, and in the distance, the Columbia River and Mount St. Helens and Mount Hood. There are three bridges here. If you can identify them, you are a student of Portland history. Let's name them in the order they were built. The first one was Morrison in 1887. That was followed shortly by Steele in 1888. Third was Madison in 1891. The name Madison may be confusing. It was later changed to Hawthorne. Fourth was Burnside in 1894. Burnside isn't in the original art, so I took the liberty of adding it. The fifth bridge to be built was the Burlington Northern in 1908, but it is not shown on this map. So the first five bridges built across the Willamette were all movable bridges, in this case swing bridges. Why swing bridges? Look again at the panorama and note all the shipping activity. The only way to connect the two halves of the city without obstructing shipping was to build bridges that could move out of the way of the ships, and the popular design of the time was a swing bridge. So the first five bridges were all swing bridges, but now there aren't any left. Why is that? I'll answer that question in a minute, but first let's visit the original Steel and Madison bridges. This is the first Steel Bridge. Built in 1888, it was the second bridge over the Willamette River. It was named Steel Bridge because it was one of the early bridges to be made out of steel instead of wrought iron. In a closer look, you can see that it is a double deck. Though you can't tell from the photo, it carried trains on the bottom level and vehicles on the top. In 1891, the third bridge was between Madison Street on the west and Hawthorne Avenue on the east. It was named for the Madison side. In this 1909 photo, the closest to the bridges is the second Madison Bridge. The first bridge, the truss and swing span were made of wood and of light construction, so it deteriorated relatively rapidly and was rebuilt in 1900, still as a swing span. With so many swing bridges to start with, why are they all gone? Because swing bridges have two problems that are remedied by other kinds of movable bridges, the lift and bascule types. First, the swing bridge pivots on a pier located in the middle of the channel. The pier itself is a hazard, and it cuts the channel into two smaller halves. In this photo of the Morrison Bridge, you can see the large wooden pier under the swing span. Second, because they have to be fully open to allow passage of any size ship, they take two or three times as long to open and close as either of the other types. So lift and bascule bridges both provide better clearance and faster operation, but the technology was a little later in developing. When it came time to replace the Madison Bridge a second time, the swing span was replaced by the lift design. This construction photo shows the lift section supported on three barges being moved into position. That was in 1910, and at that point it was renamed Hawthorne Bridge. This is a good example of the conventional lift design that had been pioneered by the engineering firm of Waddell and Harrington. The Hawthorne was the third major lift bridge built in the U.S. This design is simple in concept and execution. There are two towers with a center movable section. In this case, the central section is 245 feet long. Counterweights are attached to the ends of the lift section so that it only requires a modest amount of power to raise the section. It can travel 110 feet in less than a minute. At the time, it operated 15 times a day on average. The amount of time it interrupted traffic with each opening was just under two minutes. 
Most lift bridges follow this basic design, but here is where the steel bridge is unique. Soon after the Hawthorne Bridge was completed came the replacement of the steel bridge. Remember, the old steel bridge had two decks, the lower one for trains and the upper one for vehicles. On this map I have circled the bridge location and the rail yard. Now, lift bridges represented relatively new technology, so a lot was written about them in engineering journals of the time. We're fortunate that one of the engineers who worked on the steel bridge wrote about their thoughts. His name was Ernest Howard. He worked first for Waddell and Harrington, and then, when the founding partners split, he stayed with Harrington. Here is a description of the situation they faced. Records for the old steel bridge showed that in one year the swing bridge was moved 35,000 times. At five minutes per move, that meant the bridge was open for river traffic and closed to vehicles an average of eight hours a day. A study of river traffic showed that 80% of ships could pass under a bridge that allowed 60 feet of clearance. For the replacement bridge, they wanted to maintain the dual functions with a double railway on the lower level at the same level as the rail yards, and the upper highway level they wanted to be high enough to pass over the railway tracks. And here is the inspiration for the novel part. Quote, it was evident that there would be interruptions to traffic on the highway deck only a few times daily if the lower deck could be made to operate independently of the upper one for the passage of river steamers. To meet these conditions, the writer proposed the double action lift span. Thus, with two movable parts, this became a one-of-a-kind bridge. We started by describing the Hawthorne Bridge to show the usual lift bridge design and operation, a single deck raised between two towers. But there are other kinds of lift bridges. This is a bridge over the Missouri River at Kansas City built in 1912. Designers faced a similar situation, needing two decks, a lower deck for trains and an upper deck for light rail and vehicles. In the approach spans, the heavy rail is supported by the lower part of the truss. Light rail and vehicles are carried by the upper part. When you get to the lifting section, note the fixed truss structure is now on top. All the load is carried from above. The heavy trains ride on a deck that is suspended below the truss, shown in orange. This lower deck has to be strong enough that is stiff enough to avoid bending as the heavy trains pass over. To lift the lower deck, the vertical beams telescope into the larger upper beams, a novel design. Now you have seen two different types of lift bridges. If you combine the two lift types, you have the steel bridge. And here is the steel bridge. The central lift span is 211 feet. Each tower is 270 feet tall. The lower deck carries parallel train tracks. It is suspended from the truss above, just like the Kansas City Bridge. The upper deck carries vehicles and light rail. The upper truss has to be strong enough to carry vehicle traffic, light rail, and the trains. Here are the two ways it can operate. In its normal position, clearance above low water is 26 feet. To allow small to average ships to pass, the lower rail deck can be lifted to the bottom of the main truss. Each of the hangars has a wire rope attached which pulls it up, telescoping inside the vertical truss members. That allows 72 feet of clearance, which accounts for most of the river traffic. When taller ships need to pass, the lower deck is lifted and the main truss is raised. That provides for a clearance of 165 feet. Steel Bridge is the only bridge in the world that can do that. As it was built in 1912, this year, 2012, would be its 100th year in operation. Portlanders are rightly pr proud of their collection of unique and historic bridges. This 1939 photo includes all the movable types. The last swing bridge, the Morrison, was finally replaced in 1958. You can visit all five of these in an afternoon walk around the waterfront.